Okay, well, welcome everyone. I see people are coming in right now. Um, I'll just give it a few more minutes as people join the webinar. And this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available and shared with all the seminars after. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, hi everyone, thank you all so much for joining us for the Social Media as an Advocacy Tool webinar, the fifth session of this year's Student Advocacy Days. My name is Alex Bell and I'm the Advocacy Program Associate at Scholars at Risk. A reminder to everyone that we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on SAR's YouTube channel following the session. It is my honor to be able to coordinate advocacy on behalf of wrongfully imprisoned scholars and students in partnership with our student advocacy seminars. I want to thank you all for the incredible work you are doing. In our advocacy work, social media allows us to connect with people all around the world and shed light on important issues. At this time, especially when we're unable to organize in person, social media platforms serve as the public space or forum to discuss these issues. For our session today, I'm grateful to be joined by two experts in social media and visual advocacy, Peter Irwin and Suniva Folgen Huiskar. I imagine our audience will have quite a few questions for our speakers. And so a quick reminder to please enter your questions into the Q&A as they arise. Peter is the Senior Program Officer for the Advocacy and Communications at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. He is a Master's of Science graduate at, of Human Rights from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he conducted research on China's engagement at the UN and its relationship to the framing of the Uyghur issue internationally. He is the former program manager and spokesperson for the World Uyghur Congress, where he worked primarily as the UN representative for Geneva-based human rights mechanisms, as well as with national governments and civil society. He has extensive media experience as well. Peter and his colleagues have been invaluable partners to SAR as we work to support Uyghur scholars in prison. So thank you, Peter, for being here. Suniva is the president of SAI, the Norwegian Students and Academics Assistance Fund. She has a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of Oslo. In her position as the president of SAI, Suniva is the spokesperson for the organization, responsible for the organization's policies, and chairs the organization's board. SAI is a solidarity organization for Norwegian students and academics and works on issues of academic freedom and equal access to quality higher education globally. The organization has development cooperation partnerships with civil society organizations, intercultural higher education institutions, teacher unions and student movements in Latin America, Southern Africa and Asia. SAI also works with information work and advocacy in Norway, trying to raise awareness of the situation of students and academics globally and uses creative campaigning as an important tool. SAR has worked with Suniva and her colleagues at SAI in advocating for the protection of student expression. So thank you Suniva for also being here and welcome to both of you. So to get this thing started, can you both tell us a bit about your work and how you use social media and or visual campaigns in your advocacy? Do one of you wanna start first? Maybe you, know, you want to take it first and I'll go faster. Yes, I can. Uh, it's always a bit confusing in these sort of digital sessions to know who's going to go first and who's going to take the word. So hi, everyone. It's very nice to be invited to this webinar. My name is uh, Suniva. I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we in SAI um, utilize social media, but mainly I'm going to sort of focus on how we do campaigning and then I mean, just a few years ago when I joined SAI, social media was not the primary channel for campaigning because we had such a thing as open campuses and people were very concerned with posters and, and so on. But these days, I mean, all campaigning is only on social media now during the pandemic, but also in general, uh, even sort of before COVID, there was 
a focus uh, on sort of campaigning on social media. So all of my talk on campaigning is also going to be social media related. Um, I just wanted to give you sort of a brief introduction to what we inside do before I start showing you some examples of our creative campaigning. Because we are a solidarity organization, as, as Alex already mentioned, we were founded in the 60s by Norwegian students who wanted to show solidarity with black students fighting apartheid in South Africa. So we have a very long tradition of student solidarity and we have this sort of, um, we're kind of a unique uh, NGO in that sense because we're also driven by students. So um, I'm, well, I'm not a student anymore because I'm now head of this organization, but I joined this organization and became part of the leadership at the age of 23. Uh, and I was then just finished with my bachelor's degree. And then sort of, I was the head of the organization uh, with loads of sort of grown up uh, people working um, below me. Um, and that's sort of how we work. So we have this very sort of dynamic organization where students take the lead and where we also have student activists on different campuses around Norway. And this is one of the things that sort of leads us to do campaigning uh, in this very sort of dynamic and, uh, and intriguing way because we have a lot of students who are very critical, uh, but also who don't have the same sort of, um, what should we call them, sort of barriers or ideas of how you have to do things uh, that you might sort of find uh, when, for example, studying communication or all these things. So we, we have this kind of, um, sometimes we call it campaigning on the edge. Uh, I'll show you some examples of where that sort of, where that expression comes from. But in general, we have a lot of sort of fresh ideas that comes exactly from students uh, such as you guys. So what we mainly advocate for is the right of students and sort of the equal access to higher education globally and academic freedom. So we are a Norwegian NGO working on sort of development policy and foreign policy. So we don't work that much with people in Norway uh, and we don't work that much with sort of individual cases such as scholars at risk just for example. So we work more on sort of bigger systemic issues and that also comes through quite clearly in our campaigning. So whenever we campaign, our goal is often to change a broader issue or inform about a broader issue. And these days we campaign almost solely on the issue of students and academics and academic freedom. But previously we have been quite a colorful organization in terms of which issues we find interesting or, or want to campaign on. And you'll see that in some of the examples that I'm about to show you. So now comes the ever exciting moment where someone tries to share a screen in Zoom. Uh, that sometimes works really well, and sometimes it doesn't work at all. So we'll see how it works now. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples and also show you sort of how we use campaigning. Uh, and it's all going to end up with me explaining this background that I have here today, uh, which you might have noticed is quite different from sort of your average bookshelf. Let's see. Share screen and then share my presentation. Okay. So you're seeing it now, right? Yes, I'm seeing some nodding. Okay, so when we do campaigns in SAI, as I said, we are very much influenced by the students in our organization. So we make sort of these committees comprised of activists, people with sort of communication background uh, and our own policy advisor, and also people who work in our program team. So the people who work with our development cooperation and who knows the situation for our organizational partners in other countries. So we have this mix of uh, young activists who are just doing science a part-time thing and people with a lot of experience in the field. Uh, let's see if my, if I can actually move. Okay, so I'm gonna go through three sort of different elements of uh, how you make successful campaigns and how you also then um, succeed in social media. And one of the most important things that I wanna uh, tell you about and which sort of you might already be thinking, no, but we can't use humor because we're doing something serious. Uh, and that's not true. Humor is an extremely effective tool. Uh, and it also is something that you can use almost in any situation. So that's one of the most important things that we've used in Sci is to make sort of use humor to make people interested in an issue. And then I'm gonna talk to you a bit about angles how you can angle an issue to make it more interesting, to make people relate to it and to make people understand that it's relevant to them. And I think that's very important because especially these days, people are sort of bombarded with information all the time. And a lot of that information um, is actually relevant to them right now. For example, all these new COVID measures, but it's also something about when you're bombarded with all this information, 
that people believe is important to you and believe you need to know, you have a very hard time sort of uh, distinguishing between what is actually interesting and what is actually important and all the other things. And then you have to actually use, um, through your campaigning and through your social media work, you have to actually use angles because you can't only assume that people will find it interesting because you did, because you're already in it. And then the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you about, which are sort of two success factors, one which you can try to control and one which you can just hope for. And that is uh, to have action alternatives, ways people can actually engage uh, and also to make sure you're making something that will spread. And that's very important on social media. Um, when you sort of do physical campaigning, you can actually physically impose yourself on people. You can do stunts, you can, you can be visible, you can stop people and you can put up posters. Social media doesn't have that function at all. So it's very, very difficult to impose information on people through social media. And that's something you need to be aware of all the time when working with it. You have to actually make people uh, join your information rather than sort of thinking that if you just push out enough, it will finally reach them because that doesn't really happen. Okay, um, you see a small sort of collage here of uh, some images from campaigning. I'm going to get back to all of them to show you how they sort of uh, exemplify some of these uh, issues that I've written down here. So the first is humor. Uh, and here are four examples of campaigns that we've had inside. Some of them have been extremely su successfully politically. Some of them uh, didn't do much at all. I'll get back to that. But what we've done in all of them is that we've used humor and we've also used sort of satire. We've used humor that kind of makes you feel, ooh, can you really say that? Is that really okay? And that is extremely efficient because it gets people's attention when they sort of see something that's a bit wrong, but they still kind of want to laugh. That's when you really get people engaged. And that is one of the sort of ways of campaigning that we have experienced is the most uh, sort of efficient. So on the, now it's on my left, I'm hoping it's on your left, um, but at least the, po the poster that says beware they are educated is one of our uh, most successful campaign posters ever. This campaign was meant to lobby the Norwegian government to establish a protection scheme for students. So basically scholars at risk for students. It's called students at risk and it's this uh, poster and this campaign was one of the reasons that it actually has been adopted and has been functioning in Norway now for six years. And this only exists in Norway. So this was sort of Sai's own policy effort. Um, we had a lot of help and inspiration from Scholars at Risk, that is to be said, but it's something that sort of came from, from only us and from only students. And what we basically did here was that we made sort of a movie poster, uh, which creates a lot of sort of like urgency and it makes people um, sort of feel like something's happening. And then what we did was that we sort of made students out to be the big scary guys. And then we made all these very famous, I mean, at the time, very famous uh, dictators sort of running away from students. And what we have there is both sort of a, you sort of invert the problem a bit because normally it's the dictators taking the students and not the other way around. Um, but you also get a lot of sort of familiar faces. And that's also something that works to get people's attention is if, you ha if they have something they recognize. Um, so at the time, uh, both Mugabe, who's in the far back there, and um, uh, Husni Mubarak, uh, or not, Gaddafi, who's in the middle there, were current dictators uh, in, uh, in Zimbabwe and um, Libya. And also uh, Khamenei from Iran was also sort of very known in the media at the time. This was 2011. Um, so, so they were sort of people that everyone recognized. And so you got really intrigued to, to sort of read more about that campaign. And what also got us a lot of positive attention and, and which really works is that when you're campaigning for something and you actually engage other people in sharing and spreading your material. Uh, so one very interesting thing that happened in this instance, which actually got us some media attention that we hadn't been um, counting on was that the Iranian embassy in Norway formally told us that we should uh, shut down the campaign because we had um, the Ayatollah on the poster uh, and that was uh, a disgrace to Iran. And so because we got that um, message from the Iranian embassy, we could make news out of that and it spread and then people got more interested in the campaign. So also sort of when you're on the edge, when you're sort of provoking with your communication, that's when you get people interested and, and that's also when you can get those kinds of reactions. The second poster here, uh, which is this beautiful vista in, in Latin America where you can read where others see only jungle, we see profit. 
that was a campaign we made targeted on the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, the Norwegian oil fund, which you might have heard about. It's a ton of money that Norway invests around the world. Um, and that money was being invested in a lot of companies that were exploiting indigenous lands and so on. And there was no sort of accountability in terms of human rights. So instead of sort of saying, this is bad, Norway's breaking human rights, you shouldn't do this, and these kinds of things that everyone's heard very many times, we decided to sort of celebrate it. So instead of making a campaign about how bad Norway was, we tried to make a campaign of how great it was that Norway was exploiting this opportunity um, of uh, getting sort of wealth for us. Uh, and we had loads of different campaign elements where we sort of showed how sort of through breaching uh, indigenous people's rights, uh, the Norwegian oil fund was sort of getting profit that was higher than ever before and, and that it was so much more successful than, than other types of funds. And we also used a lot of sort of covert campaigning um, in terms of this looked like an ad poster and we actually got it published in Norway's biggest business newspaper as an ad for the Norwegian oil fund, which was a scam of course. Uh, and this also sort of made get the ball running because people were sort of very intrigued and people actually thought it was real. Um, so that also got us some extra attention. And then we have this uh, in the next one is a, is a campaign poster that I was part of making, which was um, not a success at all, actually. Uh, this, came, this one with the politicians pulling the flag. That's the flag of Western Sahara, for those who don't know it. It's... Uh, the last sort of remaining colony in, in Africa. It's um, occupied by Morocco these days. And we were trying to campaign um, for uh, the Sahrawi people to get a referendum on their right to be a sovereign nation. Uh, now this poster was meant to sort of um, get Norwegian politicians to try to work for um, Western Saharans and, and try to sort of make them engage. And we also made sort of this uh, idea of a please prize because you know the Norwegian um, the, the sort of it's Norway has a committee that gives out the peace prize. So we made the please prize, which was meant to sort of be please try to make peace. That totally flopped. No one uh, had any interest in the please prize and no one thought that was funny at all. But I'm going to show you later how this campaign anyways went viral because of our use of social media. So this was a use of humor that didn't work. But at the same time, we had sort of another thing that did work. And then finally, there's just one campaign that I want to mention, but which I won't sort of explain, because if you want to check it out, you should do it uh, on your own. It's called the Radiate campaign, and it's based on sort of how um, specifically aid organizations do their communication in a very non-nuanced way. And they tend to portray Africa as one country. They tend to portray only sort of uh, people in dire need with no agency. And yeah, some of you probably know these discussions already. Sai has engaged very sort of uh, actively in that issue in Norway, but also internationally. And we made a lot of videos of sort of this, uh, how people really want to do good, but have no idea what they're doing. Uh, so this image of sort of how many countries are there in Africa was from a video, which we called Who Wants to Be a Volunteer, which was kind of a quiz program to go out and save Africa. Uh, and that actually worked really well. And it actually got sort of viral um, interest uh, and there again you're sort of you're taking on a subject that's a bit uncomfortable uh, the fact that people actually do uh, go out with a good intention but end up doing a lot of harm um, but then when you treat it sort of in the extremes people also see how the sort of actual situation is a bit wrong so that worked out quite well i'm going to show you another example of that campaign and then you have angles so here are some of the campaigns i already talked about in the Right under the headline here, you see uh, my predecessor, the former president of SAI, who is posing as the Norwegian oil fund at a career fair at a university. And, and this is also these kinds of takeovers or, or sort of uh, ideas are also possible to use uh, on social media. Try to think of sort of how you can do social media stunts, how you can sort of get people to believe uh, something that's sort of not the truth uh, and then later sort of uncover it because this worked really well we were kicked out of the career fair which also gave us a lot of attention uh, of course um, and and no one actually understood that we weren't the Norwegian oil fund when we signed up which is quite funny in itself so that's also one thing to think of when you're campaigning trying to sort of uh, we say put on your green hat sort of think uh, if there were no limitations what would you do to create attention around this issue 
And then after you've had all those crazy ideas out, then you start thinking what's actually possible. Below that, you have a picture of a box plus a man. And that's a campaign that I was part of creating. It's called the Norwegian Educational State Loan Fund, which is called Loan Kassa in Norwegian, so it's a bit shorter, for development. So we had, this is one of these sort of examples where you have something that no one knows anything about and nobody cares about and something that's extremely difficult to understand, which is that we were trying to lobby for capacity development programs in international, uh, in Norway's international aid to create better uh, loan and grant schemes in other countries. There are so many elements there that you need to sort of understand before you understand anything. Uh, that's sort of the average Norwegian student uh, or politician wouldn't really get what we were talking about. So what we did then was that we took these two issues. So we took the Educational State Loan Fund and we took the policy and that was the development minister at the time. And then we tried to sort of make those two the issue and so that people understand that the link between those two are important and that they don't really need to understand the actual technicalities. So we basically made a, a matchmaking campaign between those two where we made loads of sort of satirical love movies on um, Facebook and Instagram playing on sort of famous love scenes from movies such as the posters in Love Actually, uh, the sort of boat scene in Titanic. We made all of these things and we added sort of the main character as the Norwegian Educational State Loan Fund and the Minister of Development. And this, uh, people found that extremely funny. So it got shared a lot because everyone knew the different romantic uh, movies. We made loads of memes and sort of, even though they had no understanding of the issue, they could see that sort of this was fun. And then once we've gotten that attention, we were also able to start explaining, this is the issue. And that's when we started to explain sort of how students in Colombia were paying 14% um, interest rates on their loan funds and so on. So, so that's how we got there. Um, and then you have in the corner here with the people singing, that's, um, remember I talked about sort of reversing the problem? This is the first video we had in our Radiate campaigns. So what we basically did was that we took this idea of everyone believes Africa is one country where everyone is poor. And we reverse it thinking, if everyone's gonna think that way about Norway, what would the message be? And so we made this sort of fundraising campaign where Africans were going to donate radiators to Norway because everyone in Norway was cold. Uh, and this actually went viral and has had a lot of success afterwards. And the same with the bottom one here. I'm gonna to try to land soon because I realize I could talk about this forever. <laughs> uh, the bottom one here is from a, a campaign uh, that's called Proud Supporters of Human, of, um, of um, academic freedom. So it's a, another campaign we did about the students at risk program here in Norway. And the thing is that the most Norwegians don't know that students are at risk. Most Norwegians don't know that students' rights are being violated or that students are being persecuted in many countries. That's not sort of common knowledge. Uh, and so we figured how can we put this issue into something that's both fun and something that people recognize. So what we did was that we made a supporter club. So one of the sort of classical British soccer supporter clubs. And we made scarves and we made sort of football cards and we made anthems. And we sort of made this whole club for academic freedom. And we had loads of nice sort of social media elements uh, where people could sign and people could sort of get the scarves and pe people could show how they were also supporters of academic freedom. And then we used the individual student stories as for example, football cards so that people would get, would get acquainted with sort of how uh, why these students were important in defending academic freedom and also why they were persecuted. And that worked out also really well. And then the last success factor that I want to talk to you about, because this is maybe the most important one in social media campaigning, is that you have action alternatives. You have something, because when people see an issue and they get engaged, they need to be able to do something. Uh, and it's using the sort of normal, please spread the word, that's nice and that sometimes works, but you need people to feel that they're actually making a difference. So if you have something they can click, something they can sign, that's nice. But if you have a way to make sure that they also spread the campaign in their social media profiles, that's the most efficient way to spread your campaign. So here are some three examples that I wanna mention on how we've done that. The first one, you see loads of people with diplomas. So we had a campaign on commercialization of higher education globally where we made a mock university with mock diplomas 
So anyone could print the diploma, take a picture and actually graduate also on Facebook from sort of a fake university. And that spread extremely rapidly. Loads of people did this in Norway and loads of people were asking, what is this university you've graduated from? And so this got a lot of traction in social media, despite sort of the issue being not at all known and not at all sort of urgent in the Norwegian debate. The second one here is a love letter. So that was from the campaign I previously told you about with the matchmaking between the loan fund and the minister. Here we actually had the opportunity for activists when they visited the website to download a letter template and write a letter, a love letter to the minister explaining why this campaign was important. And we got loads of letters from activists all over Norway that we printed out and then sort of put in a big envelope and handed over to the minister. And then we put that back on social media to show people sort of what you do actually gets to the minister. And that really worked. He was really, really flattered and he kept loads of the letters. And then finally, I told you about the campaign that flopped. Uh, so the police price about Western Sahara. That didn't really work, that didn't really spread. But what did spread was this <laughs> strange idea we had to make sort of, to try to, because we went to Western Sahara on this activist journey to try to get attention around the issue. And we planned that once we got there, we would paint our fingers blue, which is the sign of having voted. And we would post pictures of that. That was not something we thought was going to spread. But that went viral and is still an ongoing campaign today. And you can see from Al Jazeera, the stream under here that this sort of this went viral. So we started that campaign. We were like 50 activists who were in Western Sahara, painted our fingers blue with pens. And it started spreading also to Western Sahara activists, people in prisons, people all over the world. And today, the hashtag referendum now and sort of this painted blue finger has become one of the sort of main symbols of the Western Sahara referendum fight. Uh, and that just came from one green idea at a meeting. So never sort of think that something is, is not impossible and always try to think out of the box uh, because that's where you get sort of the best results. And then I said I'll get back to where we are now. So this is an example of the campaign that we're doing right now. <clears throat> so again, people don't know that students are under pressure. So what we tried to do was to use the slogan from sort of these digital meetings with can you hear me now, which everyone asks at the beginning of every digital meeting. And we tried to use that in a way to say students globally are being muted by their governments when they're trying to demand their rights. And so we've sort of played on this um, labeling and also the use of social media uh, by uh, different sort of regimes to label students as terrorists or rebels and, and so on. So here you see the campaign and we also then try to always back up humor and, and creative campaigning with solid facts and reports such as the one that's in the picture here. Okay, that was a lot of talking for me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and then uh, leave the word to Peter. Thanks a lot. That was a lot of very helpful uh, information. That was a great presentation. Um, one thing I wanted to just comment on briefly is that uh, I've been reading Saul Alinsky's rule, Rules for Radicals and humor is the first thing you would think that when talking about influencing governments, influencing stakeholders, influencing the public, yeah, it should just be factual and straight ahead, here's what's happening and, and draw on people's emotions. <clears throat> but humor is the first thing he mentions is that you absolutely need to be able to make a person perhaps not laugh in a, in a way that a comedian would, but laugh and then make them think about what's actually happening. So I absolutely support that. Now, um, so maybe briefly to introduce the organization that I work for. I work for the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, I'm in it, originally from Canada. I went to school in the UK. I uh, did a degree in human rights, ended up getting involved in Uyghur issues. So Uyghurs are a Turkic people in Western China. The US has called the situation with regards to Uyghurs a genocide essentially. So, and this is slowly built over the past five years or so. So UHRP is a research-based advocacy organization. So we do research primarily in house primary source documentation of uh, human rights abuses. And we use that as a foundation for our advocacy and our campaigning. We're not a campaigning organization necessarily, but I'll sort of speak about how an organization like UHRP, for example, is able to complement, I think, the work of really great student activists. And I'll, I'll give a couple examples of that. I think in terms of campaigning, and again, this sort of this, this partnership with groups like UHRP, like a Human Rights Watch, like bigger organizations than ours even, uh, we are able to be in those rooms with sort of governments, for example, uh, stakeholders, brands, companies who are complicit in, for example, forced labor in the region, uh, at the UN and the EU level, for example, submitting information in case documents, things like this. 
I think this is really also essential is to have both the the private and the public advocacy working at the same time and getting that balance, finding that balance is incredibly essential. So having people who are able to go out and make those public calls and use again, like the humor, I think the things that Sneva has put forward, I think that's really essential to complement the work of other organizations who are able to do uh, things sort of in the rooms with policymakers at the same time. But also do, it's an interesting relationship because I think where pressure comes from, of course, is the general public often. And I think where you get that pressure is you get, first you get attention and awareness. I think awareness raising is often used to say, well, how useful is awareness raising? It actually is essential in a number of ways. And in one way is just to pressure governments to, for those governments to understand when you're in the room with them, they see that there's pressure coming from below. When you're in the room with uh, global brands, for example, like companies, Nike, Zara, this week we're, on, we're working on a campaign actually with a larger coalition. Nike and Zara, for example, has been shown that they're, they're using Uyghur forced labor products, cotton in their supply chains. So we're calling it these companies. So when you're in a meeting with them to be able to say, look, you're getting pressure from your consumers. And this is incredibly important too. So just broadly speaking, I wanna speak about a couple things. First, okay, I think Sandeva really covered a lot of it. So, so I'll, I won't try to repeat too much. Um, so what actually makes a campaign or any kind of advocacy effective, of course, for us, it has always been uh, given the lack of resources sometimes within our staff, um, simplicity, clarity, and focus on what we're actually speaking about. Now, I think campaigning organizations can have that creative sort of uh, lens by which they campaign, but for us, we try to keep things very simple, clear, and focused. So a limited, uh, a limited campaign on, on some, a target, for example, like Nike or Lazar is very important. We could talk about forced labor. Forced labor is a problem with 80 or 100 companies globally, but if people just don't really have a conception of what that means, but if you say that Nike is using forced labor, which they are, or they're using forced labor through their supply chain, at least it's a bit disconnected, people have a better sense of what's actually going on, right? So simplicity, clarity, and focus, and also having an ask for your audience, which I think Sineva also covered, is that, of course, awareness raising is sort of in some ways the foundation, but what can the audience actually do? Whether it's, again, things like signing petitions, is it mobilizing student groups, is it working within student chapters at your university, for example, who work on human rights issues? Is it targeting things in the Chinese context like Confucius Institutes at your universities? These are all some of the examples of things that we try to push for students. And then secondly, I think which is quite important is, again, I spoke of this already, but how do you link up your advocacy, your campaigning with your advocacy? So um, these campaigns and these issues don't exist in vacuums. Uh, it's, of course, sometimes to have these campaigns happening in war and isolation that is less connected to what's actually happening with regards to your advocacy. Um, but I think it's also just much better to be able to link these different elements of your campaign. So campaigns, but also focusing on your advocacy targets, or at the same time, focusing on the media, writing op-eds, things like this, I think it's really important. Um, I spoke with about the background. I'm going to give a couple of examples. I'll try to be relatively brief, but I think there's been a couple of success stories for us. Um, I'll try to share my screen as well. And then switch over. Okay, so hopefully you can see that, right? Perfect. So this is just the foundation again. This is the Uyghur Human Rights Project's Instagram page. We don't have a ton of followers necessarily, but for us, it is the foundation to have a presence on this platform. For our, for our kind of campaigning or for our advocacy, we, again, we try to keep things very simple. We, we post things that are, that are easy for people to understand. It's a, it's, a, it's a means by which we can get our message out. It's not, you know, we, we're not targeting sort of, or our focus necessarily is not to have virality, which is, of course is very difficult. We try to just simply have what the organization is doing and to reach people. You know, so on Tibet Uprising Day, for example, we have something very simple. We have a very simple template. We were quoted in the New York Times, for example, this week. We try to keep it clear that we are a credible, legitimate organization, which actually does have some kind of uh, success in terms of work with the press. Now, Ruse was just this week or on the weekend. Uh, reports, again, just clarity, very simple uh, to show you what we're actually doing. It gives you a little bit of uh, information about what's actually happening in the reports. Um, one example, too. So, this was sort of a a private public campaign, we were trying to get one annoyance for Uyghurs is that often the press spell Uyghur wrong. They spell U-I-G-H-U-R. Uh, that's incorrect. Uyghurs don't see that as the correct way to spell it. 
Finally, Associated Press Style book came out and said, look, we're actually, we've listened to Uyghurs, we've listened to the communities, we're gonna change it from U-I-G-H-U-R to U-I-G-H-U-R. Sounds like a small, a small, small thing, but these small wins also in the context of the larger struggle are, are very, very important to get the press in particular, to get a governments to listen to what Uyghurs are saying. I think this was something that was actually quite successful. Um, yeah, and we do short videos. Uh, we have Uyghur artists increasingly too. So this is a cover of a recent report. Uh, we had a Uyghur artist draw this up. This is on uh, the uh, forced confessional videos, essentially. So you sort of see the, the person here who's, who's on TV. So CCTV will, will show these kinds of forced confessions or these proof of life videos. But you can clearly see that the backdrop is, you know, basically a detention cell. I won't focus too much on us again. And this is very simple. We try to keep it incredibly simple. We keep our messaging very simple. But I think a couple others, one that I want to highlight too is what I'm working on. There's a bit more space to operate. This is the No Rights, No Games campaign, which I'm running as part of the, so China is hosting the Olympics in 2022. Now there's been a lot of talk in the past few months about what's actually happening. Should they be hosting? Should we, we be calling for boycotts? Should we move the games? The issue is that the IOC has been pretty uh, intransigent and they have not been responding to concerns. So we launched this actually about a year ago and it sort of sat for a while. Then we had just a very basic video. I'll play it now. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Right, so very simple. Essentially, the message is we're, we're contrasting the what's happening in the Uyghur region against what the, the Olympics, for example, are, are apparently um, stand for. So we have the simple quote from the Olympic Charter about human dignity, preservation of human dignity, sort of in contrast to what's ha happening in the Uyghur region. Now, because of this campaign, we are able to get a, uh, a member of our staff, my colleague who was on Joy Chavela uh, that week because they were interested in the campaign and won't play this. The white paper also but we were able to get an interview out of this. There was a bit of press around it. And again, the campaign itself is mostly dealing in contrasts. Right, so you see here, you have the, the Olympic sport, you have what's actually happening in the region. And more recently, again, there's been more calls for boycotts. This is more a more recent video that we released. Again, trying to contrast what's actually happening in the region versus the response from the IOC, which has been quite muted. You know, this is over time in 2018, 2019, these, these uh, issues uh, were pretty clear. So just trying to show exactly what, what's been happening and by 2020, 2021, talk of genocide increased, right? So essentially I, I sort of cut off the end, but the, the end message is don't tell us that you didn't know. You knew exactly what's happening. You knew what you're getting yourselves into and there's no excuse. And then there was also one thing that we caught as well is that the Olympics, unfortunately, I think this was back in July, they posted a video sort of celebrating the 1936 Berlin games, which of course were, no, to say controversial is to put it lightly. Of course, Hitler was in power then. And this video came up on the Twitter page of the IOC, which is pretty shocking in the tone of death. Right. Right, stronger together. I mean, we caught this. They ended up taking it down because I think the Holocaust Memorial site in uh, at Auschwitz, for example, commented and said, is this really something you want to be celebrating? They took it down, but we actually captured the video and put that up to show people what the Olympics were saying or what the IOC was saying and how tone deaf they are. A lot of comparisons have been drawn between what's happening in uh, China and what happened in 1936, for example, on the eve of obviously the Second World War and the Holocaust. Um, maybe I'll stop there, but I'll also, again, I think one example of sort of linking up advocacy is that, yeah, this campaign exists here, but the purpose of this campaign is not simply to necessarily just inform people about what's happening, it's to link up with things like getting public uh, support for what we're saying, to get the attention of the IOC. Me and our colleagues were able to get uh, meetings with the IOC uh, a few months ago, we've been in talks with them, for example, so that's 
a way in which you do sort of this public private advocacy. The IOC is to, to, to make a couple comments, they're fairly useless. They're not gonna be responsive to this, but they are responsive to public pressure and they are responsive to being tarnished. Their image is tarnished already. Um, but let me just show this. So the, the, actually the purpose of this was to form a foundation for a petition to the IOC. Uh, I think this has 260,000 signatures, which isn't, it's been a little bit inactive recently. I think there's been more talk about boycotts and having a stronger approach to this, but essentially the call was, uh, to the IOC last year that if you want to hold the Olympics that China needs to respect human rights, they need to close the concentration or internment camps that they're operating and they need to respect Uyghur rights. So there's a bit of a, there's some support there and we're thinking about actually sort of revamping this and actually getting some more, some more pressure from the IOC. Um, I'm going to stop there. Those were a couple of examples. Let me just stop sharing my screen. And then I can speak just more generally about other issues if you have them, if there are any questions, but that's sort of our work. Again, I think I want to underline the fact that having this, in some ways, humor, strategic approach from a campaign perspective, getting a viral video, getting it connected up with media, for example, uh, working in complement with advocacy organizations who are able to be in the rooms of the governments is essential. I think that's where you actually get change. Pressure from one side, pressure from another side. And in the context of China, you need pressure from all sides, otherwise you won't get much done. So I think I think both of these approaches are, are really complementary and are, are very effective, but happy to stop there and <clears throat> take any questions or, or speak about any other issue. Thanks. Thank you both so much. That was so insightful and helpful. I took a ton of notes because just, I think scholars at risk, we can learn so much and I'm sure the students feel the same. And I think one thing that I saw in all of the examples that you showed us is for both Sai and Uyghur Human Rights Project, you both have very clear um, branding and style and consistency in your form of messaging, whether that's through like satire and humor and this really creative visual campaigning that's clearly around a certain issue or campaign or on the Instagram for UHRP or the Olympics issue that has such clear style and branding and consistency, which is really nice. And I think makes it so much more succinct um, and really powerful. So that's really great to see. Something that we're exploring at Scholars at Risk is using Canva as a tool to um, create graphics more easily because Adobe InDesign is a nightmare for those of you who have any experience. But um, if any of you have suggestions for tools for the students who are interested in creating these kinds of graphics or designs and platforms that are easy to use, please feel free to mention them. I think um, both of you also really clearly shared um, you know, your strategies and tools that make a social media campaign a success and recognizing when things aren't a success and, and don't work out and how you can, you know, change course and get creative with um, brainstorming new solutions. Um, so I want to ask another question, but I would also encourage the participants to utilize the Q&A to ask questions that um, Suniva and Peter can answer. You can direct them to just one of our panelists here or both of them. So please feel free to utilize that function. Um, so at least for the student advocacy seminars and scholars at risk, um, for many of our cases of imprisoned scholars and students, there is very little available information about their current situation or any updates or developments in their case. In such instances, do you have any suggestions or advice on how we can use social media to continue to demand the release of these individuals? Are there any strategies you use to continue to draw attention to a specific issue or campaign when there isn't any new newsworthy or catchy information? Yeah, I can say that sort of um, for our work, which I personally think, of course, is the most important work in the entire world, fighting for academic freedom and, and students' rights, that generally doesn't make the news uh, in Norway. We have, we're a small country, we're 5 million people. Uh, we don't have like university, we have a tiny university newspaper, which sometimes squeezes in some international news, but in general, there's not a big public debate on international issues and it, it never reaches sort of our niche of international issues about students and academics. So we're generally working in that angle all the time. 
Um, and also because our issue is always sort of happening, it's always uh, recurring and it's not like it ever stops. And I think uh, one thing is to create sort of new ways to say the same thing that you've said before is very smart. But I think another thing that's very um, ingenious and especially in social media is to uh, just adjust your target group, try to also get sort of partners, try to partner up with people. And I think that's my experience mainly from sort of working. I've been in the leadership of this organization for three years now. And uh, I always get invited to different sort of uh, youth uh, groups, youth parties, um, political parties, different sort of organizations. And they're like, oh, wow, is this an issue? This is so important. How can we engage? Um, so that's one sort of clue to you guys. If you're sort of struggling with showing your sense of urgency or getting people engaged in the issue because you don't have anything else, some for someone else, this is new in itself. Um, and especially sort of being localized at a university, I would try to sync up with different sort of parts of the university, other associations, other organizations. Is there a student representative council, for example, trying to sort of uh, get into their platforms, ask if you can have um, a lecture to them about what's happening, maybe they can pass a resolution and especially make them share things on their social media because that's the most effective way of reaching new people on social media is to get other people to share um, because the thing is that you only reach your own little echo chamber. So you want other people sharing to their echo chambers again. Um, and I think one of the most efficient ways uh, to get, either it is to get other pages or other people to share your post, but also to get one of those posts where people start tagging each other. That sort of, that should be your goal. Whenever you make a post, try to make it a post that people will either share or tag someone in, because then you know it will spread way beyond the audience that you already have. Uh, and in that case, I think something can always be new to someone. So just trying to find someone else to sort of expose it to and make them share it to their audience so that you sort of, yeah, keep broadening the group that gets the information basically. And you can also, I mean, make a point of it. Um, why don't we know anything more? And, and if there's somewhere where you can actually inquire for that information, maybe make that the point of the campaign, if that's possible. That depends, of course, in the, in the individual case. Yeah, those are all really great points. I want to pick up on new audiences. So for us, again, it's always been a struggle to sort of find, uh, to, to, to get inside that echo chamber, I think, because of course you have the human rights people on your side. They're, they're, they're done, you know, they, they agree with the you already are. Policymakers to a certain extent as well. How do you get, for example, sports fans to get on your side now? There's opportunities that have come up in the Uyghur issue in particular. So Mesut Ötzel, a German football player, made a lot of news around when he had an Instagram post about the Uyghur issue. Uh, and he caused a lot of problems for Arsenal uh, because there were contracts that were cut. Arsenal, I mean, China is a massive market for football, for example, soccer. Uh, so finding ways in which you can engage on this. We tried a little bit, but maybe we weren't so successful because we didn't have the resources. But finding these audiences, like sports audiences, uh, is, is really, really important because people care about this stuff and often sportscasters are looking for things to talk about because you can only talk about sports for so long uh there, there are other angles and this is why the olympics i think is important too is that you have a whole new audience completely new audience to speak to um but also to the point to the question essentially um about sort of how do we ensure that cases that are not received any kind of information or not illicit information from, from China, for, for example, or anywhere else, I think you can make that the story in some way. So that's the first thing. Make it the, a point that the fact that you're not even able to understand what's happening, their family members aren't able to contact them, that's a story in and of itself. And again, it's about, uh, secondary point is, how do you link that with what's actually happening, for example? So one thing I did, and this works with op-eds, you know, whether at the university paper or elsewhere, I was able to pitch an op-ed to the Guardian and it got accepted, not because of necessarily what was happening, it's because there's an anniversary of a, a key date, 2009, July, which would happen in Urumqi. The details aren't so important, but they accepted the op-ed because they thought this is a perfect date, a 10 year anniversary of a major event. It, but it allowed me to pivot from that and speak more broadly, or I guess more specifically, what's happening in the past couple of years. So I think this can work with campaigning as well, is that you can take either cases in which there's no information and pivot from that and say, look, this case means something for this reason. It's, it's indicative of what's happening. So Ilm Tokti, a Uyghur scholar who I know scholars at risk has, has focused on, 
his case is absolutely important. Not, I mean, he was arrested a number of years ago back in 2014 and sentenced to life in prison. But his case was kind of the warning shot for all other academics in China. So I think that's the angle that we take is to say his case is important, not because it's, he's an individual who was arrested, but because of what it means in terms of the broader context of the, of the, of the situation and what it means in terms of how you're advocating for these people. Because often these cases can be forgotten uh, and we work our hardest to work with the families, for example, to make sure they're not forgotten. Rahila Dawood, for example, is another scholar, I think scholars at risk has focused on her daughter has been working on this campaign for quite a while to free, I think it's called Free, free My Mom or Free Rahila Dawood. She's a Uyghur academic who's in prison, but there's no, there hasn't been any information at all. And this is a perfect example is that, okay, well, what do you do? I mean, you just keep hammering this home. And again, I think again, to some of his point is that you find these new audiences, you find people too are rightly shocked about what's actually happening and you bring in other stakeholders and yeah, you, you just keep hammering away. I mean, advocacy for us just is about consistent or I guess being persistent and pushing these cases and, and the US government often or other governments ask, well, who are the cases we should raise when we meet with Chinese officials? And of course there are some notable cases, but there's also, thousands and thousands of other cases of individuals whose family members are speaking up about them that we try to highlight as well. But Ilham Tofti, Rahila Dawood, for example, are cases that we can show that this is a trend in society. It's not just them. It's what's happening to all of them. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you both. Those were both really helpful answers. Um, I love the idea of shifting the audience and trying to find new audiences that could join in and support your work. Um, I think the idea of sports, at least for the seminars, is a really interesting idea, at least for Uyghur scholars and students thinking about, um, at least for like the brands that are creating the jerseys for the uniforms for your university sports teams, you know, whether that's Nike, trying to investigate if they're using, if they're any way connected to forced Uyghur labor could be a really interesting way to go about it as well. Um, and, you know, one thing that we often recommend is to link up with the academic department of the scholars discipline or students um, discipline or academic interests and try to collaborate with that academic department. Um, so like engineering, for example, and, and speaking with um, any engineering associations or student organizations or the department itself and asking them to make statements. And through you know having these kinds of public statements, you can also generate more attention and awareness if even if you know you're not getting news developments about the individual's case, you can kind of create news based on like building your audience and and um, folks who are around. Peter, I see your hand is raised. Do you wanna add something? Yeah, just very briefly on forced labor in particular. I think, the, so we're one of the steering committee members of a larger coalition working on forced labor is the Worker Rights Consortium. The Worker Rights Consortium was born out of student activism in the 90s, specifically targeting uh, university apparel, like sweatshirts that have the name of the university on them, because they said, look, we don't want to be wearing, the students said, we don't want to be wearing t-shirts or sweatshirts that uh, have been made with forced labor, and many of them were forced labor or just in factories where conditions are very poor. So one of the leading figure, one of the leading groups of this larger coalition who have been essential in this fight, I think, was born out of student activism, and it came out of the student groups from the grassroots building up this, this organization that, like, I think it's spread across in so many different campuses. And that's one point too, is that you can see your own activism from your own university or college, but how does it relate to other work that's being done by other colleges and student groups as well? It's helpful. Certainly, thank you. And I think we've kind of touched on um, my last question for you both on target audiences for the students, but hopefully we can dive into it a little bit more. I know we're nearing the end of the session, so very quickly. Um, there are many NGOs working on the issues of free expression and academic freedom, or that work on the countries that we or the students are working on. These NGOs and experts are already very active in terms of campaigning and social media. Could you speak to what students add to these campaigns and are there audiences you recommend students target in their campaigning? Yeah, I, I can begin uh, again, maybe. I think uh, I think sort of Peter said something very important earlier about sort of how 
raising awareness is extremely important sort of in any sense and also because sort of the efforts of uh, one individual student on campus actually complements uh, the work of the person who has made it into the parliament uh, or into the sort of government ministry meeting. And I think this is true for very many instances. I've been in quite a few of those meetings where I've actually literally shown sort of pictures of students uh, doing stunts on campus and using that as an argument to make my case. And I think that's very important to think of when you do your activism and, and when you do sort of social media campaigning and, and sort of these students' advocacy seminars is that even though you might not actually reach that meeting with the minister, the fact that you have created awareness and the fact that you've created noise around this issue makes that job easier for that other person who actually gets that meeting. And, and in many cases, you're not alone in what you're advocating. And, and there are many people who are sort of working on the same issue. So that's one thing to remember that whatever you do is actually very important for the momentum of the issue. And then I think I would sort of think of what are your, uh, what are the things that are good about the way you work and, and where you are situated. I think one thing that's important to think of is when you're not an NGO, you're not sort of untouchable for institutions. Uh, and I get this a lot because I, I work in an, in an organization where we have institutions who are members of us, but who still hesitate to share our campaign material because we don't really share things from, from organizations. We have a very clear communication policy, et cetera, et cetera. NGOs are, are sort of maybe sort of barred from from being shared by institutions, important people and so on, because they don't they don't share from organizations or they have a very strict policy. But you as a student don't have that role. You don't have that position. You're not sort of someone to be feared. And you should actually sort of revel in that sense that you're just one uh, student group, because that, that actually gives you the opportunity to, to be sort of not scary uh, for people to share. And I think one of the things that I would definitely do had I been sort of uh, in a student advocacy seminar or or one thing that I regret not doing more when I was in my local chapter, uh, which is sort of our activist groups, is to actually use that student role. So for example, get in touch with your rector or like your chancellor or whatever they're called at your university, the, the head of the institution and say, I'm really interested in this issue. This issue is about academic freedom. Do you want to write an op-ed with me? And then because you're sort of just just a student, an innocent student who is sort of uh, engaged in an issue that the rector also has to be engaged in, there's a big likeliness that he or she will say yes or will share your post or will write about you in the, in the university press or so on because you have that position as a student at their institution. And, and this goes for sort of rectors, it goes for, for faculty pages, it goes for sort of all the sort of different social media accounts at a university as well. Try to use that status as a part of the university to use the different university information channels because those are very difficult to get into from sort of an outsider perspective but as an insider you you can sort of try to actually get heard and that can actually mean that you can reach a lot of people so i would i would do that um and then i would sort of also try to see how can i use the tools that all these other NGOs and organizations have already made? How can I use their um, reports? How can I use the statistics that they've created? How can I sort of utilize uh, all the people that they have employed to do these things to make my advocacy better? Because this is a team effort, so you don't have to do the same work if someone has already done it. So I would also, also do that and also get in touch with them. Uh, ask to come and talk about your issues. Ask if they want to come and help you uh, advocate for your issues. Um, because it's generally a difficult struggle for everyone. So I think that sharing experiences is also something that would that can definitely be useful. Yeah, those are all great points. I think the, the, the last point in particular, also about the certain amount of student freedom. Before you have a job, you have a bit more freedom to speak your mind openly. You're not going to be, uh, you know, fired or you're not going to have issues with your employer, for example, as a student, I think you have more freedom. And again, I think the point Suniva makes as well about the obligation the university in some ways has to you. You're a student, you're paying, you're paying tuition to a university or college. They have a certain obligation to, to listen to what you're saying. And this, again, I think this connects again to the point I made about the Worker Rights Consortium and these students getting together is that they identified, and this is an important point, they identified an issue which is directly related to the school and the school has an obligation to actually take care of it. And then the, finding those targets, finding those things that your school, so you might think an international issue has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with the school, we're too small. No, it's just not how it works typically. Find those targets within the schools where there's the connection. In the context of China, for example, <clears throat> is there a Confucius Institute on your, on your campus? Probably take a look at that. 
uh, are, you know, again, the forced labor in terms of, uh, again, it's hard to think of ideas. I would have to probably take a look, but any, every school is quite different. Um, do you have a point about that, Sneva? I have a couple of things. Yeah, I would just, another thing there, I would check your university's investment portfolio. All universities are huge sort of entities and they normally have sort of huge uh, funds uh, where they invest in different companies. And that's also a way to go about sort of see, is there anything happening in a country that you're concerned about and, and so on? Is there any human rights breaches and so on? So that's also a very sort of form of activism. I bet you find loads of Chinese companies in, in different sort of university funds and so on. Absolutely. And this is something that UHRP is looking for as well. It takes research, but for, so for example, actually UHRP did work not with the, the Norwegian Wealth, Sovereign Wealth Fund, the biggest in the world, but we, we definitely targeted them with campaigns inside and out. So we had Norwegian activists in the Nor Norway Weaver Committee going into meetings with their ethics board saying, look, you have contracts and you have investments in Hikvision, Dahua, companies who are supplying this facial recognition software technology and the cameras that have facilitated directly the detention of Uyghurs. And they were actually responding to this. They've been reasonably responsible to some of these issues because I think the Wealth Fund sort of prides itself in some ways on being more progressive on these issues by divesting from, for example, fossil fuels, by divesting in companies who do contribute to human rights violations. But there are better and worse pension funds, for example, at university students, student sort of teacher pension funds are a big target for us. So yeah, I absolutely support that as well. Um, and then just briefly, yeah, I mean, linking up with human rights programs or campaigns in university, uh, finding, again, in the Uyghur context, are there Uyghur uh, uh, students at the university, for example? Often Uyghurs aren't in a position to be able to speak actively, but speak to them. If you see them speaking actively at the university, talk to them, think about what a campaign could look like, whether they're in a position to do a campaign, for example, those are a few ideas. Um, and then also, we had an activist, uh, Rehan Asad, who, who had worked on her brother's case. Her brother is, is in detention in China now. She went to Harvard. She wrote an op-ed in the Harvard Crimson, for example. Like she, you know, these op-eds actually work. And this, this op-ed sort of served as a foundation for her advocacy later on. Of course, it might have been sort of a bit of an, uh, 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 a, a narrower environment, the Harvard Crimson. Uh, but it sort of spawned a number of other op-eds from her and it spawned her advocacy and set a foundation for what she was doing. So yes, I mean, there's a lots of Lots of connections your university probably your university probably has with uh, rights abuses. You just don't know it. And it does take a bit of research. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think that just opened up a whole can of you know ideas and areas to dive into for further research. Um, I think what you both said about how students can really help build momentum and keep the conversation going, whether that's locally, internationally, I think is really crucial. And also really looking at where students are situated, right? What campus are you on? What are the resources you have available, the audience immediately there, where you might be able to find the biggest impact um, and utilizing social media and visual campaigns in that way. Even though we're not in person, I think you know that kind of activism is still possible in this virtual space that we're in, hopefully not for too much longer. Um, but I just want to thank both Peter and Seneva so much for speaking with us and sharing such valuable insight and advice with us. Thank all of you for joining us today. And we hope to see you at next week's webinar on March 31st at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will hear from Shiwei Wang, a scholar formerly imprisoned in Evan Prison, Iran and his wife and advocate Hua Chu. The webinar next week is open to the public, so I encourage you to share it with your friends, families, and communities. Especially during such a divided and challenging time for all of us, I am so moved and inspired by the time, energy, and work that Peter and Seneva and all of you dedicate to advocating for the rights and protections of those who you don't necessarily know, but nonetheless feel connected to. So thank you so much, take care, and be well. Bye. Thanks a lot. And thanks for having us. It's been very nice to talk to you guys. Thank you.